Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Campaign for Liberty's core principles are a really, really deep thing to me. Um, we believe in fiscal constitutional government. We believe in a sound money system. <laughs> we believe in non-interventionist non foreign policy. And we portray these through activism. We work as much as we can to get these things accomplished. Um, I really thank you guys for all your time tonight. I'm not going to waste too much of your time because Bill is honestly really a lot better at this than me. So. Um, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I hope you enjoy. Okay, first things first, we're going to get rid of the bass out of here so we're not having it feedback every time we turn it up. There we go. Okay, how's that? That works pretty well. Hey, why don't we test out the microphones real quick, Tanya? Could you give that a hit? Testing, one, two, three. Okay, do I control that, uh, no. Kevin? Or is it? Testing. Okay, very good. Uh, testing, works. testing. All right. Good. I think we'll call this good. So, um, I know this is... One of those things where I haven't quite figured out who we're going to have start. Why don't we just start, uh, I think what we're going to do is just go probably just left to right on answers and then just stagger the next question, the second person starts, and then we'll kind of just go around. I think it's a lot easier than me trying to remember. Okay, this one, then one left. And so anyway, we'll just uh, start it off this way. And like I said, kind of an informal, squishy time. I'm just getting my timer. If you can just give me a second here. There you go. Ah, works. Great. Left the, the watch in the sun, so it's still working. Uh, <laughs> all right. Just give me a second to get a couple of things together. One of the people that was uh, putting on this uh, event tonight was not able to come, so you have to excuse me. I'm going to be uh, working a little bit off the phone. It's like, oh, I emailed you some questions. Great. You know, I'm going to try to <laughs> do everything out of a... Uh, Tablet. Out of a tablet, a phablet, or whatever the case might be. All right, um, we're going to have uh, Kurt uh, take the first question, Kurt Ankerberg on the left there. And we just wanted to talk about the Chamber of Commerce question here first. That's what we wanted to talk about. Uh, Chamber of Commerce has proposed a, a new public private partnership in order to build a new convention center. And I'm kind of wondering what is your opinion of this project using taxpayer money to help pay for this privately owned uh, development? If you could uh, go ahead. First of all, thank you for all coming out here tonight. Uh, personally, I'm against public-private partnerships. For those of you who live in Medford, you're familiar with them very well. Uh, we had the Lithia Commons, where the taxpayers paid for about $16 million of the Commons, and Lithia Motors paid for about $16 million of the common, yet they own 100% of the Commons. So we paid for half their freight on that building. If you look at the Evergreen Building on 8th and uh, Main Street, the One West Main Building, uh, very rude. Turn your phone off. Come on, turn your phone off. Hey, I'm, I'm doing mine too. Don't worry, Kurt. I'll give you some more time. All right. We also have the Evergreen Building downtown, which is just being built right now. I don't know how many of you know that we... Come on. Okay, I tell you what. Why don't we just hold everything off? Uh, we'll, we'll do one of those things like they do in the movie theaters. Go ahead and turn... Please put your, your phone in cinema mode, or whatever they call that. All right, are you ready? Kurt, right. why don't we start from the beginning well, of this one? Well, if we go back, we have... Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to have a sense of humor, I guess, Kurt. Well, it could be this way in a county commission meeting. As I said, the, the city taxpayers, we got stuck with a bill paying for half the commons. We paid for two-thirds of the Evergreen Building, over on 8th and, uh, or pardon me, Main Street Evergreen over near Joseph Winan. We, the taxpayers, paid for $15 million of that building, and Pacific Retirement Services only paid for seven of it. Uh, we got shortchanged in that too. What the Chamber wants to do now is they want you to pay for roughly one half of the cost of a new convention center they want to build downtown, but they're going to own it. 100% they'll own it, but we have to pay for it. Now, the county just told you recently they didn't have the money for the libraries, they didn't have money for the extension center, and they lied there. I hope we have time, I can get into it in more detail. But um, when you have the county saying on one hand, they don't have the money for integral services, but on the other hand, they have money to pay for the good old boys' private developments. I have a problem with that, and I strongly oppose it. 
Thank you, Kurt. Rick? Well, I think one of the, one of the most important uh, roles of, of government, and especially county government, is uh, economic development and making sure we're doing everything we can to, to provide and to provide a, an environment for job creation to uh, occur. And if that means uh, capitalizing on our position as a regional hub, I think that's a good use of funds. I think that's something that can actually bring some, some incredible economic benefit to the Valley. Um, we, we don't have a convention center. I think we could draw a lot of events to this area, including local Youth sports, uh, that's something I've been involved in. I, I was at a, a tournament one time in Reno that had a thousand teams there. A thousand teams equates to about 10,000 kids, equates to somewhere in 30 to 40,000 people that were in that town for that event. Uh, you can only imagine what the economic impact of that would be. So sometimes uh, government has resources to use for the benefit of people. And I think in this case, that is a use that could be of great benefit to this area. Uh, and it's something that I think I would be in favor of. Of course, we need to make sure we go through, do our due diligence, uh, look into the entire project, make sure it's something that, that is uh, done in a, in a reasonable and responsible way. Uh, but I do think that's something that can bring a lot of benefit to the, to the Valley uh, and to the citizens. All right, thank you, Rick. Uh, Curry Chancellor, what would you uh, think about this potential Chamber of Commerce issue? I, I yeah, go ahead and grab, that. if you can grab the microphone, please. <coughs> Thanks. I agree with, uh, with Kurt on that. I, I, I've never believed in uh, joint ventures between government and business because the taxpayer always gets the shaft in the end, always. And there, I can't think of any exceptions for it. Uh, government has failed at almost everything that it's ever attempted since its inception. And uh, I, this has never been any different. I can understand that uh, there's a lot of people want this, this to be initiated. Uh, in fact, the Chamber of Commerce is handing out $20,000 checks to see that it is done uh, to candidates that agree. Thank you. All right. Hey, thank you, Kurt. Tanya, what do you have to say about uh, potential convention center? Uh, as I mentioned in my interview with the, the CPAC the other day. I, I don't know a lot about the details, so mm -hmm. I, I've not seen a budget, and I would find it really surprising that they're asking the county to contribute, you know, even a 50% of the capital cost to do that. So, in any event, I have gone on record, and I told them, I, I definitely um, support public-private partnerships, um, and I do believe that this is a form of economic development, and that's why I'm in this race. I'm in this race so that we can, I can work on, we can, as a county, work on developing our economy as well as our community. Um, so, you know, public-private partnerships doesn't always mean, you know, um, paying 50% of a project or more. It can mean just uh, contributing a, a, a minor amount so that the other private parties can leverage their dollars, whether they're, you know, nonprofits or for-profits. Um, so I believe that, that we have that ability to assist in leveraging, and I also believe that um, we can provide assistance in other ways, just showing support um, and showing community support. That helps that helps uh, corporations and nonprofits get grants all the time. So those are the kinds of, th of things that uh, we can do. And I'd like to. I'm really looking forward to looking at the budget and the, and the entire proposal. Okay, thank you very much. In fact, uh, next I wanted to uh, ask uh, just kind of about your basic qualifications. One of the big uh, parts of being a Jackson County Commissioner is controlling a $300 million said budget. So basically I'm looking for each candidate's elevator pitch on what makes them most qualified for uh, taking on and helping direct $300 million. Yep, starting with you, Rick, Rick Dyer. I have a lot of experience. For one, uh, beginning with my experience on the Rogue Valley Transportation District Board, um, one of, the, one of the, uh, the duties there is to review and approve a countywide governing agency's budget on a yearly basis. So I've done that for the last five years with the RBTD board. Um, also, I have run larger businesses in, in Jackson County, car dealerships, uh, where we had multi-million dollar budgets to, uh, to, to run and to manage there as well. I've run my own business uh, where budgeting uh, in the last six years uh, in the construction trade was essential. If you didn't have good budgeting skills and good business skills, you weren't going to survive. Uh, my, my business 
even though I started in 2008, probably the worst time in the history to start a construction business has actually thrived in the last six and a half years. Um, I also have a degree in business administration and accounting. Uh, I have a lot of experience looking over financial statements, actually preparing financial statements. Uh, so I believe my experience and depth in that area um, is, is superior. Thank you, All right. Thank you Rick. Uh, Kurt, what would your take be on that? Well, I think probably the most qualified. Yeah, if you could use the microphone just so people, I'm sorry, just so everyone can hear you the same way. You're really pushy about that. I'm going to be pushy about that microphone, I am. I'm a, mac I'm a microphone guy, really. <laughs> right. Or Kurt, you know, thank you. Well, I think it, you know, I'm, I'm a common sense guy. I, uh, and a problem solver, I solve problems. Uh, and a common sense would tell me that Kurt Ankerberg is the only one really qualified here, and the best qualified, uh, to run a budget. That's what he does for a living very bright guy and that's his trade but as far as I'm concerned there's a lot more to it a lot more and uh, I believe that the budget's a very small part of it we've got some very smart people in our employ in the county and uh, if we're short on some we'll get some more but um, I take advice from experts and uh, people with a lot of experience and I apply it and I'm very good at applying thank you all right thank you Tonya, what are, are your qualifications, you believe, for running the budget? Well, I apologize to, to those of you that have heard this before, but um, I'm going to talk about my qualifications for this position just generally, and I'll talk about the budget in particular. But as many of you know, I've been practicing law um, in Medford here for 24 years. And during a time in my career, I was representing, I represented several local governments, including the city of Jacksonville, Talent. Gold Hill and Shady Cove, and those were fun and interesting times. I did a lot of land use work for um, the city of Jacksonville. But as general, general counsel for three of those cities, um, part of the duties include assisting the city council with the adoption and setting the policy of their budgets. I've also um, been the um, former president, president of Quail Point Rotary, who's engaged in, in Rotary for many years, and I'm, I'm recently back out in private practice, so I'll be, I'll be joining the, the country club group um, soon. But um, I've also been on the board of on track for eight years, and I, I don't know about how many of you know about the scope and, and, uh, of that program, but it, sometimes I think it's, it's a quasi little, um, Jackson County in, a, in and of itself. It does a lot of great work for our community. It, it actually um, is engaged in low-income housing as well as all of the addiction and recovery stuff. So it, involved in that role as being on, uh, being on the board includes the review and the adoption of multi-million dollar budgets. Um, they've got quite a few capital assets. So um, those are some of the qualifications with regard to um, budgets. I'm now, uh, I own my own business again. I, I did for a while in the 90s before I went into the Federal Defender's Office for 10 plus years. Um, and during that, that time um, as the Federal Defender, and, and now as well, I've, I've still got the majority of my caseload is federal appointments, mostly appeals. But during that time, I, I was on a daily basis, be, uh, had the privilege of being able to advocate and um, for the constitutional rights of individuals. and. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, we stood up against the power of the federal government. That's, that's often the case as well. So I'm eager to do this work, and I believe that I will uh, be able to apply um, the same kind of level of dedication and diligence, and I believe I have um, uh, demonstrated through this practice that I've had for 24 years the, the ability to have courage and the skills to critically think and to, to uh, creatively think, and again, to stand up and argue the cause. So uh, with that, I think I'm very excited. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Kurt Ankerberg, your thoughts on a uh, $300 million budget, and go ahead and toss any other qualifications out while you're at it. Probably should have done that at first, huh? Well, oh, you learn it as you go along. As Bill said, the primary job of a commissioner is to do the planning, formation, and the implementation of the county's $300 million budget in addition, commissioners sit on various boards with uh, fiscal authority over public money. So the commissioner's job, they are the financial managers of the county. Now who am I? I'm Kurt Ankerberg, CPA. I'm a certified public accountant. I'm an Oregon certified public accountant with 30 years experience as a financial auditor, a senior tax manager. I was a tax manager at Moss Adams locally. 
Uh, I've been a chief financial officer, and I currently, for the last 10 years, I've owned my own CPA practice. Now, I've worked at two of the 10 largest CPA firms in the United States, which should tell you that I've dealt with really big clients. I've dealt with from the smallest mom and pop businesses up to multi-billion, multi-billion dollar corporations that I've done professional work for. I've had thousands of business clients that have called me their most trusted business advisor. Um, so my business experience compared to everybody else in the stage is like I'm in the big leagues and they're in the minor leagues. Uh, Tanya Morrow was a public defender for 10 years and before that she was a junior staff person for a small law firm. She's never dealt with financial issues in her life. Um, she talks about doing some work for a few small cities. I've audited the, uh, the city of Rogue River so I do have experience with not only doing for-profit companies but also I've dealt with governmental agencies as well. So I, by far I'm the most qualified person to do the job of commissioner. Thank you, Kurt. Next, I wanted to get a bit more into economic development and kind of looking for your, now yeah, your, your feelings about what kind of industry mix. There's been a lot of uh, tension here in the Rogue Valley for a number of years. I've talked with uh, county commissioners on uh, the radio, past commissioners, and there seems to be kind of a some people would say, well, you'd like to be wine, wine and tourism, and other people are saying, well, we'd like to be back in the woods, and other people are saying, well, let's be a retirement mecca, and they're all kind of in, uh, in tension right now. That's just three that come to mind. Uh, Kurt, uh, take it. What kind of mix of industry would you think would be ideal, given what the Rogue Valley is, demographics of the, uh, of the valley, the people who are here? And the microphone. <laughs> I'll just hand it to you next time. Okay. All right. Well, you know, that's, that, that's interesting. When I moved here in 1959, of course, everything was logging and, uh, and uh, sawmills. And uh, uh, the, the monkey faced owl, or for whatever it was, uh, started the whole thing. And then little by little, everything has been just, just crazy. It's like business became a dirty word. We have watched the commissioners not only put business after business out of business especially small businesses that employ three or five. And they put them out through regulations that uh, you can't comply with. Uh, they put them out with uh, processes. Uh, they're constantly on small businesses about violating this, violating that. They're on them all of the time. They, 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 they can't even get up and get going in the morning without a fine. And they've eliminated all of your, all of your rights to defend yourself. You have none. There's, there's no jury trial in a civil matter. You have lost the ability to face your accuser. You've lost the ability to have an elected judge. You've lost the ability to go to the appellate court. You've lost the ability to go to the Supreme Court, state or federal. And what bothers me more than anything else is that it doesn't bother more of you. You have no idea. I've been investigating this government for over 13 years. And I have a file on everybody down there. And uh, if I'm elected, what I will bring is a style of leadership that you haven't seen since the last time you watched an old John Wayne movie. There's a lot needs to be done down there. And uh, I know where, jokingly, all the bodies are buried. I know the process that we had. I know how it worked. And I know how to get it back. And all of that will not only serve business, it'll serve you as a taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Tanya, if you could uh, design a Rogue Valley via county commission policy and such, uh, what kind of a mix would you like to see? Well, one thing I think we um, need to acknowledge is that the, the county um, controls the majority of land use decisions with regard to resource, the resource lands in, in our county, so that it would include farms and forests and, and, and that. So. I think we have a particular duty um, to to see that those those lands are developed and that we are focusing and fostering um, agricultural production, and that includes the forest too. Um, so, when it comes to forest, though, one of the one of the things I think we need to do, and we need to keep folks working in, in the woods, is we we definitely need to demand um, the. Uh, for, federal government who possesses and owns, what, 50, 60 percent of those forest lands that to um, maintain them. 
we actually need them to, to get the budgets, to get the work done. It's, it, it's extremely important, and there's a lot of biomass that we need to get out of there for purposes of uh, fire safety, as well as to, to put people to work. Um, but primarily, my emphasis, as I've been going around the county um, talking about and, and sharing, is to transition our community to clean energy. That's happening. It's happening at the federal level. It's happening at the state level. So I want to emphasize um, work to be done on energy efficiency and renewables. Um, again, agricultural production, which includes a lot of value-added stuff. So we have a niche here right now, and I'm hoping that we can um, encourage investment in, um, in organics and uh, continue to expand our, our great seed producers. Um, but I also am interested in high-tech manufacturing, and I've been meeting with some guys in the um, tech industry. Most of them are guys that come to our, our lunch meetings once a week. And um, so they've been telling me about some of the needs um, in the community to continue um, their ability to innovate and um, some of the needs we need to, to make sure our workforce is capable of in innovation. And some of those things include um, hack labs, where we can have access to um, CNC equipment, it's a computer numerically controlled equipment, and co-working spaces. So I think um, some of my goals are to engage the whole community in some of the strategic planning regarding the energy transition um, and this high-tech kind of stuff. So right. that's it in the show. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Kurt Ankerberg, what would you uh, say would be a, a good mix if you were to you know, envision knowing what you know about the Valley? First of all, I don't think it's the government's job to dictate the mix of business in the valley or anywhere. It's not the government's job. The government should get out of the way and let the free market decide what jobs or what type of businesses come here in the valley. Um, what I would do as a, a commissioner, I would create an environment that would be conducive to business. What we can do is reduce regulations because regulations are a barrier for businesses to start. We can reduce or eliminate licenses, fees, or permits that are costly and another burden to business. Um, what we need in the Valley, we need a diversified economy. What we have here right now is heavy in medical community, but we also have a heavy service industry and service jobs pay way less than manufacturing jobs. What we really need are more manufacturing jobs in the valley, not more retirement homes that create more service jobs that are low paying. Now, Ms. Morrow talks about high tech coming in the valley, and I'd like that, but before you have high tech, you need to have a high tech college, and we don't have that. We have a very poor rated SOU, which is a liberal arts college, it produces a lot of liberal arts graduates that don't know anything about science at all. And if you know what the top degrees are that are, that, that are, that are in demand, they're business, they're engineering, and they're computer science. And SOU has a very poor business school, I can tell you as a CPA, it's the worst business school in Oregon. Uh, they have no engineering school at all. And their computer science school, I think they only offer a bachelor's degree and it's very poor. So before we even talk about high tech coming into the area, we need to have a college that produces high tech grads. And that's one thing I'd like to do is have some influence on SOU and try to change it over into a school similar to Chico State. If you look at Chico State, they offer all the degrees I told you about. So we need to create grads that will attract businesses here, plus those grads, when they school, they develop new products. They're the ones that invent new products and new services and that. And so we really need to change our education. Uh, I should also say, if you look at the elementary schools here in town, uh, I'm very involved in the Medford School District and their test scores last year from third grade all the way through 11th grade, they only had a 58% math pass rate for the whole school district, 58%. That's pretty bad. You're not gonna have high tech in this valley until we have higher test scores than 58%. Uh, pass rate. So there's a lot of things we can do. The best thing we can do is get out of the way of uh, business and let business function without government putting a lot of burdens on it. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Rick, what would you have to say about that, about business mix? I do agree. First of all, we need to get government out of the way. Um, one of the things I don't agree with is uh, tech sector. We've already got some, some tech sector uh, businesses here that are doing very well. Uh, we have the infrastructure and we do have uh, a ready 
willing and able workforce, and I believe our, our universities can easily train uh, individuals to go to work uh, in additional tech sector businesses here. Uh, there, so there's already several of them doing well here. What we need to do is we need to have a more focused approach uh, as far as attracting new businesses that are in that same category. Um, instead of just, just saying, hey, we're a great place to live and work, let's go, let's go identify some of these businesses that are located elsewhere and let's show them what we've got here. And then we can, we can attract these businesses that will uh, employ people at one and a half, two, up to two times our median income. And when we do that, a few of those jobs go a long way. There's a multiplier effect that those folks need services, they buy products, uh, and that's the way we grow our economy with those good paying jobs. And I do believe that we have the ability to do that, and there's a lot of them that are succeeding here now. And I'm, I'm of the all of the above when it comes to our economy here. I think we need to get back to work in the woods. Uh, absolutely. It's not going to be what it was. We're not going to be a timber-based economy anymore, but it certainly can be a very integral part of our economy, especially in the rural areas that have been hit the hardest. Uh, I've been to some of those, and they are devastated. Uh, and we need to, to remove the barriers to get back in the woods working again. Uh, and that's something that I would certainly advocate. Uh, tourism. Again, we need, to, we need to do what we can to increase tourism. We have a great place to visit. We have lots of things to do. We have a lot to offer and sell. Let's, let's, again, all of the above, all of these create jobs, all of these create economic impact. We don't want to forget about or, or ignore any of them. Uh, in our viticulture, we have, a, we have a thriving and growing wine industry. Uh, it's certainly something that we can expand on as well. Uh, these, are, these are all things that will create jobs, like I say, create uh, economic vitality, get our area thriving again. We just need to put more attention uh, and really focus on these things. Uh, and that's what I intend to do, an all of the above approach to getting this economy back where it should be. Thank you, Rick. Next question is uh, having to do, uh, do with, with rights. And I think it's uh, pretty appropriate. We'll start with Tanya, because you, you had mentioned here a few minutes ago about uh, working with some ACLU and rights defending and such. It was a number of years ago, in fact, not all that many years ago, that uh, Jackson County and the administrator ended up uh, putting in an alternative to, uh, well, code enforcement. You didn't go into a, a court of law any longer. You went into an administrative court, administrative hearing, rather than uh, jury trials. Oregon Constitution, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing off the top of my head. I'm not a legal legal, so please forgive me. Uh, but the Oregon Constitution states very clearly that um, you have the right to a jury trial in all matters, civil and criminal. And what I wanted to find out from you is that if this is something that you would be willing to restore with, uh, with Jackson County citizens who come under uh, dispute with the county, because they can't right now, and um, if, um, if this is a right that you think should be restored, and how? Well, I'll say I, I do believe in our jury system, and it's unfortunate that um, the, the way our laws have developed more recently, very few people access the jury, and there are a lot of built-in reasons why, especially in the criminal context. Um, so it, it, it is a shame, because serving on a jury is actually a integral part of our constitutional structure. I think it was, Justice Scalia said this probably about eight or nine years ago, serving on the jury, you can act as a decision maker with regard to whether the executive department has fairly exercised its right to enforce. But so when it comes to administrative law, however, there's no federal constitutional right. The federal constitutional right only really kicks in when there's the possibility of incarceration. So to the extent that there's a state right, I have, I favor it. Obviously, the downside is, and this is another reason we don't exercise jury um, rights too often anymore, is the cost of it. It's extremely, extremely costly to, um, to actually bring in juries and go through that whole process. Now, for administrative um, proceedings, you, you, could, you could use a six-person jury or even a three-person jury. Um, and I think you know, we should look into that, especially if the community believes that going to a hearings officer is not satisfactory. So I'm, I'm willing to get out there and listen and, and see if we should look into that. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Tanya. Uh, Kurt Ankerberg, what would you think about the administrative law issue? As uh, Ms. Morrow said, I believe one of the reasons they have administrative law is because it's cheaper to administer than having a jury trial. However, 
the U.S. Constitution or the, and also the Oregon Constitution guarantee you the right to a jury trial. So to make it short, if I get elected, I guarantee you that people like Kurt Chancellor will get a jury trial. I'll make it happen in some form that they will get their rights taken care of. Okay. Rick Dyer, your thoughts on this matter? Well, I do believe that the citizens need to have adequate representation and adequate uh, remedy if there is uh, a situation where they they are going to be deprived of, in this case, it would be property, uh, life or liberty aren't going to be at stake, uh, but there needs to be a due process. And I believe uh, if if it's not adequate to, to protect their rights, then we need to find a way that is. Uh, and, and we need to do it affordably, too. Everything. All ideas um, are great until you start talking about the cost and then you have to balance them. I think there could be something, uh, a citizen uh, mediator or uh, arbitration process that, that's by a group of, of peers uh, that maybe can be administered um, with, with less expense. Uh, but I certainly think that, that citizens definitely need to have adequate representation when they are up against uh, a government that is attempting to deprive them of, in this case, property and due process says that there needs to be a system, a process that, that meets minimum standards of fairness and an opportunity to be heard. And if that's not occurring, then it needs to be remedied. And I would certainly advocate whatever remedy uh, adequately protected folks. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> you know, I find it real interesting. I've been to 437 commissioner meetings. And up till two months ago, I've never seen any of these people at any of them. I've been investigating this government. I've been writing articles, 77 published articles on administrative rule, on the law, and on the Constitution. And even though I'm a high school dropout, I teach the Constitution to the Patriot Movement. And everybody here, an attorney, practicing, and a wannabe. And they think that it might cost too much. Well, you know, the Constitution doesn't say, in all civil matters, you have a right to a jury trial. It doesn't say if we, we have some money. It, it doesn't say if it's not too inconvenient. Everybody's forgot that that Constitution created all of this. And it regulates all of it until it starts being interpreted. And Article 1, Section 15 of the Oregon Constitution says in all civil matters, the right to a trial by jury shall remain inviolate. And I don't know whether it shall are inviolate, they don't understand. It's the law of the land. It's not an idea. It's not a concept that you can change. If I'm elected to this office, you have never seen a whirling dervish like I can be. And I'll guarantee you, you'll see change down there. And it might even seem a little scary to you sometime. But it'll be the sound of freedom coming back to Jackson County. Thank you. Okay, next question will go to uh, Kurt Ankerberg. Uh, Kurt Ankerberg will start this one. And this is, uh, we talked about this off and on last time around too. Is climate change an important issue to you in your uh, platform? What policies do you believe would be good for Jackson County to follow, if any at all? For climate change? Yes. He has to take care of climate change issues. Boy, as a candidate, we got pestered, all of us got pestered recently by Rogue Climate to come to their, um, their forum they had a few days ago, and I didn't go to it because I don't agree with them. I don't think there is climate change. Uh, I am concerned about the environment, clean air, clean land. I'm a very hardcore outdoorsman. I ski, I hike, I bike, I raft. I raft a lot. And I would never want to ruin the environment. But I don't see the evidence that there is climate change. I just don't see it. And in fact, if you read the paper, 
in the last month, Obama's, uh, one of his scientists came out and said there wasn't climate change, and then there was a couple of scientists from the University of Washington two weeks ago that said that the change we have is not human caused. I, I think that these people that are into the climate change gig, I think what they need to worry about is just our environment here. Most of those people are from Ashland, and I rapped a lot on the road, as I said, and Bear Creek is the number one polluter on the Rogue River uh, with the Ashland sewage plant, with the ranchers over in the Ashland area, with the orchardists, and with the leaching septic tanks. And yet you don't hear any of the so-called environmentalists in Ashland ever say anything about the pollution on Bear Creek. Yet you see the biologists say, don't put your hand in Bear Creek or you'll get infected. It's that bad. But they don't say anything about it. So. I don't think there really is uh, an issue with climate change. I think it's more of an issue that they want to do a transfer of wealth from wealthy people or from businesses to low-income people. But I don't really believe there is true, true climate change right now. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Rick Dyer, your thoughts on uh, climate change? Any policies you would or would not enact? Uh, I, I don't think that that's really within the purview of, of Jackson County commissioners uh, to enact the type of legislation that's being uh, introduced. Um, and I, I kind of agree. I think there is some evidence uh, that CO2 emissions cause somewhat of a, of a greenhouse effect. Um, it can raise temperature slightly, but I don't think that what's going on, if the climate is changing, it's natural causes. I don't think that we're at a point where the evidence is overwhelmingly telling us we need to do something that negatively affects our economy and especially affects the middle class with energy costs. Um, my business, uh, I believe that we need to do whatever we can to be more energy independent, more energy efficient. And what I've done for the last six years is I, I run a business that, that does replacement windows, energy efficient replacement windows. And I'm, my, my company is responsible for 600 homes in Jackson County using less energy uh, because of efforts of a private individual. And I think the private solution is, is working. And it can work, and that's where government can walk, can step in and encourage businesses to do these uh, the things, the map, the uh, the things that will improve uh, or reduce our energy consumption. Um, and that's, like I say, what I have done in my business. And I don't think it's the role of government to step in and, and again, without 100% clear-cut evidence, uh, affect such a significant portion of the economy and just about everybody's lives in this country. Thank you, Rick. Court Chancellor, what do you say? <laughs> Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Very helpful. Should get an injunction on me if I didn't use it. The jury's out on that. Okay. Right. I, uh, I find Rick's take on that real interesting. You know, I never thought of myself as an environmentalist. I mean, I understand the common sense reason you don't put an outhouse next to the kitchen. I understand that. And I'm willing to work with those types of things, common sense things. I don't believe in global warming. Uh, some of the, a lot of the very smart folks in this uh, country, when it all started, uh, felt that uh, it would take about seven to 900 years of accurate kept records to even get an idea that there might be global warming. And we were only about six or seven hundred years worth of uh, logged and kept accurate information, so I don't buy it. And uh, I think Rick is wrong again about there's plenty we can do about it. The reason I ran for commissioner several years ago was that um, that silver-haired lady back there, Jean Wallman, uh, caught Jackson County dumping uh, waste in a wildlife refuge, Denman Wildlife Refuge. Then we found that the same county road department was uh, dumping and digging holes and burying barrels and everything over uh, just below the, uh, or above our water treatment plant. And uh, it wound up with uh, several high-ranking officials, our assistant uh, county administrator, uh, Joe Strahl, our uh, county road department, and uh, several other people losing their jobs. Uh, they losing their retirement and forced into retirement. 
Now, I never thought of myself as a, uh, an environmentalist. I just thought of common sense. You should look around a little. It didn't right. And I was shunned. I was attacked uh, verbally. And I, every agency that the county had come down on me. And um, I'm not from around here. I grew up in Texas. One Indian uprising, one Texas Ranger. We, uh, we work a little different. And I stayed on it, and it's been changed. And your county and your parks are better for it. And I will not change that tack. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Tanya, climate change is an important issue to you and your platform. What policies would you be in favor of or not in favor of as a commissioner? Well, I can just start by saying that um, I believe that science is reliable, um, but we can agree to disagree on that. That's not a problem. What, what's at issue is um, the things that we could, should, would do in order to be prepared for persistent drought or catastrophic fires or just more fires that put smoke into our valley. Um, and with regard to the other side of that coin, um, the transition to energy efficiency is, is part of the reason that national government, the federal government has programs now and the state has programs. And there's every reason in the world for us to, to, to uh, benefit from those programs and bring some of those funds here to work on transitioning to energy efficiency. Who can, who can uh, really complain about solar uh, arrays powering our county buildings, our, our electric vehicle infrastructure? But beyond that, we have this retrofitting that we can do. It's just energy efficiency. It's the, the work that Mr. Dyer is doing. It is already, at this time, subsidized, um, in, in part by, by at least a, a state program. The power companies are required to put some of their profits into the Energy Trust of Oregon, and the Energy Trust of Oregon has programs to provide rebates, and of course the county, I mean the state also gives tax credits and stuff for this work, and I'm sure Mr. Dyer's, some of Mr. Dyer's client, clients have uh, benefited from that. That's the kind of work, that, and the funds are out there to do this kind of work, and we, we just need to get on the ground and do it, and we can employ a bunch of people, laborers, um, energy auditors, um, contractors, we can even employ additional finance people to do this work, and um, and so that's that's definitely something I think we could do, and we'll save our we'll save money, and we'll become a little more energy independent. Okay, let's stick with the energy question here, or at least the energy theme here for uh, the next question. We'll sort of expound on this a bit. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, the Mail Tribune front page today they had a talk about. Uh, uh, Jackson County is going to be handing out uh, tax breaks. What was it three to five years? I don't have it in front of me. I'm kind of just going from memory right now. Uh, in enterprise zones in Jackson County, for uh, people who are building uh, renewable power types of uh, businesses, it could be biomass, it could be anything. And I did find out from Danny Jordan, he did a text message me back and says, yes, it does include hydro if they would allow anybody to put up a dam someplace. I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but be that as it may. They just tore them all down. Tore them all down. Yeah. Yeah. Why would we do more? OK, well, I digress. OK, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just move along. Uh, Rick, at what level should Jackson County be involved in energy, in the energy markets? Because effectively, that's what we are doing now with our county policy. Well. First of all, there are federal regulations that we have to uh, comply with that say, and, and I'm not saying I necessarily agree with these standards, uh, but 15% of your power production needs to be in renewables by 2015, 25% by 2025. Uh, so I think it's, again, not, not necessarily a policy I agree with, but, but Jackson County is being proactive to try to uh, adhere to these standards. Um, I think an enterprise zone, for one, it also does uh, encourage uh, the, the construction of infrastructure and, and uh, something that, that's generating power, that, that's, whether it's renewable or not, I think in, in our area is a good thing. Um, and the, the tax break only covers, it covers three to five years, and then it goes away. And, that, and I don't think a, a power producing um, plant is going to relocate after that time. That's usually the fear with enterprise zones is they take the tax breaks and run. I think that that's something that will then start generating tax revenue at the end of the three to five year sunset. Um, 
I, I believe in the, the enterprise zone concept as it applies uh, to businesses that are going to employ people. Um, and, I, and I don't think that it's an unreasonable use uh, of, and it's not, a, it's not an actual cost that we're writing a check for. We're just deferring some taxes for a viewer to, to help build some infrastructure. And again, help us adhere to some standards that we're going to have to adhere to. Okay. Thank you. Kurt, what do you think about that? Um, oh, sorry. Oh, microphone. <laughs> uh, what do you think about uh, the county is going to be handing out uh, taxes in their enterprise zone three to five years? Uh, about 10 square miles, I guess, in Jackson County would qualify for this. Uh, at what level is it a good idea for us to be getting involved in the energy markets? Well, I, I, I again, uh, believe that the only thing that uh, you need for business is for government just get out of the way. Just keep its mouth shut and get out of the way. Government has taken taken businesses out of business. They have they, they have done nothing. We have looked and looked and searched. Uh, we have five reporters over at the U.S. Observer tried to find something that government had succeeded in. We never found a single thing that they've succeeded in, except messing up everything that it gets involved in. And you, the taxpayer, pay for it. I would think at some point you start thinking about a revolution than uh, letting these guys continue on the way that they're doing. Uh, I don't believe in a tax zone. I don't believe in government making any zone, except maybe a speed zone or a school zone. Uh, they need to get out of the way. We're the most regulated society on this planet. And how's that been working for us? How have we done so far? What I want to see is Jackson County stand up and fight back. We have an association of counties here. They need to be put together. And all these little counties need to be formed into a fist and start telling the state government and the federal government not so fast. I don't believe in government involvement. If that was the question, Bill, I get carried away. I think I pretty much got that. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, Tanya, your thoughts on this, these uh, enterprise zones? Yeah, um, tax I unfortunately didn't get a chance to, to, to read the article this morning. Um, but I, I barely glanced at yeah. it, too, I know, but I thought it was kind of it, dovetailing with what we were it's, talking it's about. It's good, and, you know. I, and I do believe in enterprise zones. And uh, what we're talking about here is a tax deferral, right? Um, and I'm guessing that um, the bottom line will be that the, the benefits to the community of generating power here, i.e. not having to buy it from Pacific Power because it's generated here, and the benefits of the potential additional independence that Book of Energy provides us is going to outweigh to the general community and the bigger community just whatever the costs are to de defer those taxes. Okay, thank you. Kurt, what do you say? First of all, I oppose enterprise zones. I've done studies on them, and basically what happens is you have businesses that are immediately outside of the enterprise zone, and they move two or three miles into the enterprise zone in order to get the spoils, whatever's given away. They stay in that zone for a couple of years just to get the freebies, and then they leave. Um, enterprise zones are basically like a sugar high. They work for a short period of time and that's it. Enterprise zones also, what they do is they make you subsidize them so people that aren't in the zone, the government takes their taxes and gives them to the favorite industries. And I don't like that. I don't like to play favorites. Um, now as far as uh, renewable energy, we live in the Northwest and the number one renewable energy is hydropower. If you look, that is the, the cheapest and the most efficient. And if nothing else, that's what we need to focus our attention on is, is hydropower, not solar. Solar and wind power are both expensive. The only reason they exist is because they're subsidized by the government. If you look at the environmentalists, the, the so-called environmentalists, they're worried about hydropower killing fish, but they don't tell you that solar power fries birds like crazy. I mean, like crazy, it fries birds that go over it. Um, it burns them up. Eagles, hawks, any kind of bird, it goes over the, the solar windows and it burns them up. The same with the windmills that do the wind power. 
eagles, hawks, and other birds, they go through and they get chopped up, they get sliced and diced. And also with wind power, it cre creates a droning noise that drives people crazy. Seriously, it drives them crazy that people live around the area because it has a low pitched droning noise. So one thing I would do, I can guarantee you if I become elected, is I'm gonna push to restart and complete Elk Creek Dam. In fact, I've already had discussions with Jim Buck, who is the, the head of the Army Corps Engineers. That's the one of the things I wanna do the most is uh, to do a dam there so we have more water storage, to build a hydro plant there on Elk Creek so we can create more power. But I don't think that the power that the environmentalists want you to get right now, the um, wind power and the solar power, I don't think they're efficient at all. and I don't like them. Thanks, Kurt. Next question, we're going to go into a couple of the state ballot measures just so you can kind of get an idea how you feel about uh, their position on a particular issue. And let's see, I think that Kurt... Yeah, Kurt Chancellor's next. I think I got that right. So, Kurt... Uh, <laughs> all right. Ladies and gentlemen, he can be trained. All right. You can't teach an old dog a new trick, right? That's <laughs> wrong. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, position on GMO labeling of food products. This is uh, Measure 92. What are your thoughts on that? Just give us, uh, if you made a decision on it, your thoughts? Yes, it's, it's simple. Everything that I've worked with as a mechanic, everything that I've worked with as a welder, everything, I'm a gun activist. Uh, I probably got more guns than Smith & Wesson, but uh, I learned how to work on them. I use them. Uh, I play with them. I sell them. I buy them. And everything I use in every aspect of my life has ingredients on it. And I can't imagine having something that is uh, as controversial as GMOs not being labeled. And I believe in labeling on everything. So yeah, I, uh, I'm for labeling. Okay, all right, thanks Kurt. Uh, Tanya, what's your take on Measure 92? I support Measure 92. Um, I believe that if we're going to have a label, we should have all the information on it. So having a label without that information is a concern because it's by omission suggesting that it's okay. And I don't need to get into the science about GMOs. I know there's, you know, it's controversial. Um, but the, the counter argument to labeling um, is, I think, mostly just about cost. And from what I know, there's so many countries in, in the world that um, are refusing GMOs without labels. So these companies, most of these companies that um, sell these um, um, products that are, um, that's what I'm looking for, I'll move on, um, already are doing these, this, these labelings because they're, they're in markets that are in these countries that um, are concerned and require labels. So I doubt it's going to be a huge uh, financial burden to the companies that make processed foods. That's the, kind of, that's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. I ate some Doritos on the way over, too, just to let you know. It's, I'm feeling okay at the moment. Kurt, uh, your take, Measure 92. Uh, first of all, I want you all to know that I'm the only candidate up here that publicly supported Measure 15119, which is GM GMO measure in uh, May. I supported that, and uh, Rick Dyer opposed it. Tanya Morrow had no opinion, and I didn't hear an opinion from Kurt Chancellor. Now as far as uh, the 92, I oppose it. It's more regulations by government that's going to increase the cost of your products. Um, the measure was poorly written. It only applies to grocery stores. It doesn't apply to GMOs that you get in a restaurant. So if you go in a restaurant and eat GMO food, they're not gonna tell you that. So it's just only gonna address one small area of the market. Now I think that if the GMO people they want you to know that you're not eating GMOs. All they have to do is put a sticker on their product and says, this is GMO free. They don't have to worry about making somebody else put a label on their product that says they have GMOs in it. They can just say their product is GMO free and they didn't really even need this, uh, this measure. They could have solved the problem that way, but they want more government regulations and no, I don't agree with that. Okay, uh, Rick, what do you say about that? Measure 92. Well, I do believe people have a right, and they have a concern uh, about what's in their food. Um, I do with, with myself, and especially my son, uh, and, and kids, all kids in general. I think that uh, it's important to know what's in it. The concern about this particular measure is 
does it adequately give you notice of what's in there? And does it, does it protect you against all potentially GMO uh, containing foods? Uh, GMO fed beef, for instance, doesn't have to be labeled. GMO fed dairy cattle, the milk doesn't have to be labeled. So the concern I would have is there is going to be a cost and that is not the determining factor, but does the cost actually justify what protection we're getting and what guidance we're getting? And that needs to be looked at. But I do believe people have a right to know what they're eating and labeling in general, absolutely. I think that gives people the information that they deserve and that they need. Thanks, Rick. One of the intractable problems we've had here in Southern Oregon, if you've listened to any talk radio station over the last, oh, I know, 40 years, is about uh, getting, they always say we need to get back in the woods. So we're going to ask a question about that for the next time around here. So, uh, Tonya, you're the first one. You're going to take a swing at this one. Um, there has been talk about um, getting control back of public lands. People would like this. Uh, how we would go about this, I don't really know really care there's all sorts of ways of disposing and I know I'm doing all sorts of qualifications of the question before basically do you think that we as a county commission should be trying and doing our best to uh, to lobby for return of control of these federal and or state lands I haven't seen you know the proposals and the um, arguments in favor of them but I such a such a move but I, I just doubt that um, I would support such a, a, a transfer of ownership. I believe that those um, are forest. They've been in federal ownership, and they they are now part of the, the larger public trust. And I think what we need to do is continue to put pressure on the federal government to manage and maintain those forests. There are several reasons to do that. The primary one is um, for health, for the health of the forest. But those forests and that management, it's a multiple use management and it has served us well. We've got all kinds of um, tourism through recreational activities that are provided and we can still put people to work in those forests by bringing out the, the um, biomass um, in order to keep them healthy as well as to put people to work. So I don't think I'll support um, bringing our, or transfer of title and ownership okay. of those forests. I'm going to add a follow-up to this uh, at the same time, if you don't mind, Tanya, and uh, since we're on the subject, and ONC Act is still in effect. And the ONC Act says that very clearly the ONC lands for the county are supposed to be uh, maintained for only one purpose, and that is sustainable timber yield, not for mixed use, not for anything else. Uh, would, would, you, would that change any of your opinions about this? Well, I'm not sure if it's so focused, but I do know there is um, an intent to essentially, I guess in a way, compensate the counties for, for this inventory that's in the, the federal control. Um, I think we can think outside the box in, in 2015 and start finding other bases for which to demand, to the extent we feel it necessary, compensation for, from the federal government for, for having that inventory. If they maintain it correctly, it's a benefit to us because of the value of the timber standing. Um, if, if we need additional funds, then we can look creatively at potentially getting into an energy market offset. There's other ways of, I believe, advocating and arguing to the federal government that the county needs to be funded at some level because of our sort of ultimate stewardship, ultimately, of those, of those federal lands. Okay, thank you. Kurt Ankerberg, what would you say about that forest lands? First of all, we have a contract with the federal government, the ONC Act of 1937, and the contract says that the land will be managed by the federal government in a sustainable manner, and that the 18 ONC counties will get 50% of the revenue from the timber, and the federal government will get 25%. And that worked fine for a while until the environmentalists threw a monkey wrench in the whole machine and stopped the government with lawsuits from cutting. So basically what the, what the environmental groups like KS Wild have done, they've created economic terrorism on our county and on the other ONC counties by stopping the mandated cutting and 
the first thing I would do is file a lawsuit against KS Wild, some of the environmental groups for economic damages, and we're talking about huge economic damages. Then I would file a lawsuit against the federal government for a breach of their contract. We have a contract that says they're gonna give us 50% of the revenue from the trees in lieu of property taxes, and it's really clear. And so I'd sue them for breach of contract. Then I'd also sue the environmental groups, and I'd also sue the federal government for uh, economic damages and uh, health damages because every year, because they neglect the forest, they don't cut them and they don't maintain them properly. We are, we've had lately some huge forest fires. And I know last year in the summer of 13, the town of Merlin and the town of Grants Pass were basically closed down for the entire summer. Their economies were destroyed because of the huge fires over there in the wild and scenic area of the Rogue. And it destroyed a lot of uh, tourist industries. It caused a lot of senior citizens to have breathing problems. It cost you a lot of medical problems. And those aren't being addressed. So not that I like to go sue, but it's the way that the other side operates, and so I'm going to sue to enforce the contracts we already have uh, right now. Now, as far as returning the land to the state, the, the land does belong to the federal government, and they have a contract with us to provide a certain amount of funding. Um, the only way I'd want the land back from them is if they breached their contract, and it would be easier for them to give me the land and let me manage it. I'd rather have that, but legally, it's their land unless they want to give it to me because I'm a pain in their ass, and they'll give me the land just to get rid of me. <laughs> okay, thanks. And uh, Rick, your take on this. ONC, Forest, getting it back, what, what do you say? I think the, the ONC Act is very specific, and it does say it was for the uh, and, and timber harps uh, on those lands. I think it's been construed through various lawsuits out of complete, out of existence of what its original intent was, intent. Um, and, and that being said, um, I, I do believe now the federal government is breaching uh, that contract, and they're also breaching a duty uh, to maintain the, the forest and protect the health, safety, and welfare of, in the, our case, Jackson County citizens. So there is a void there. There's a void that can be filled by county government. And we should be able to go in and maintain those lands. Those lands are in absolute state of neglect. Uh, obviously, they're tinderbox. There's the underbrush uh, is is as dry as a bone and ready to go up at any moment. The densities are are 10 and even 20 times what they uh, have been in their natural state. Uh, we don't have access roads. We don't have fire breaks. We have all of the ingredients in these woods for a potential million acre fire or better. And if that happens, all bets are off. Our, our economy is, is absolutely devastated for the foreseeable future and we need to prevent that. And as I said, the federal government has neglected uh, their duty to protect and to maintain those forests and there's a void created that needs to be filled by, by county government and by our uh, resources to get in there and take care of that. Thanks, Rick. Kurt, what do you say? Microphone. Uh, sorry, you were, you were doing so well. <laughs> you don't call on me for a while, I just digress. I, uh, <laughs> I don't agree. Uh, 1935 is quite a while back. Um, but this goes a lot further back. The Constitution goes a lot further back, 1775. The federal government can't own land. Article 1, Section uh, 8. Uh, says clearly that uh, two different states gave up some 10 square miles so the seat of government could be created and that they will have all authority and legislation over all places purchased by the consent of the state in which the same shall be for erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. And to back that up, every time we made a purchase of a territory, it was created. When it reached 60,000, it had the right to vote for statehood. And in every instance, the land was given to the state until the purchase of Alaska and of the Northwest. And the crooks back there in Washington, 
saw all of the great wealth above the ground and below it, and they screwed you again. Thank you. Okay. All right. Hang on just a second here. I'm trying to enlarge on my phone. And even with a phablet, I still have trouble seeing it sometimes. It's amazing. All right. Uh, Kurt, I think you're the one that takes this one first. A lot of miszoned property in uh, Southern Oregon, and a lot of illegal de uh, divides, and a lot of people will call and, and have talked in the, over the years and saying that uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of help. What would you as a county commissioner do to help alleviate miszoned, illegally divided properties or just trying to set things right, if at all? First of all, I'd like to know why it was the illegally zoned, but we're talking about people like Glenn Archambeau. Yeah. Miszoning, things like that. Um, we need to settle those issues. And so I'm good at putting a square peg in a round hole and a round peg in a square hole. If there are miszoned properties, I'll clean them up. I'll clean them up fast. We'll do what we need to do to bring them above board and make them legal. So I don't think it's a big issue, really. I'll take care of the problem and rezone it. Okay. Uh, Rick, you have a take on that? Uh, I'd say very similar. I, I think that each is a unique situation, needs to be handled differently, um, and just taking all facts into consideration, and especially taking into consideration the rights of the person uh, that does own the property, and working on an equitable resolution uh, that allows uh, the person, if they're making their living or, or living on the property, uh, to continue doing that, if at all possible. All right, thank you. Kurt. I got three quarters of an acre on Taper Rock Road, <laughs> and uh, it has three different zones and three quarters of an acre. I found that out when the county was shutting my business down and telling me I was a bad boy for the last 42 years and I couldn't continue. And uh, I, I, I never even realized that it had three, three zones. So I asked the uh, uh, social, oh, not socialist, uh, hearings officer, and uh, he said, uh, I asked him, I said, which one of my zones am I in violation of? And he said, well, let's just consider you're in violation in all the zones, and uh, find me 600 bucks. But uh, it's easy to clean up. You just, you just need to have some commissioners that have an agenda and that agenda is doing right for the people and not doing what's right for government. Thank you. Okay. Tanya? Bill, I wish I knew about this issue. Um, and I don't, so I apologize if I'm not feeling prepared to really address it, except to say this. We have um, processes for which people can come in and apply for variances and exceptions to general standards. Um, and so I would imagine, to the extent that the county can assist in this situation, that might be a process that could be initiated. Maybe it's already been tried. I don't know. But that would be a place to start, I would think. OK. Thanks. All right, very good. All right, back on a ballot measure for some entertainment this time around. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, uh, Rick, on um, recreational marijuana. Your right. thoughts on that? First of all, I think uh, as county commissioners, we need to be proactive, and we need to take this, if, if this measure does pass, as an opportunity to start to close some loopholes and some abuses <laughs> that are in the current medical marijuana uh, system that we have. And it's allowing medical marijuana to end up in the hands of kids, it's allowing drug cartels to come in and profit from you know, the lucrative crop that we have here. And those loopholes need to be closed. And if this new legislation uh, is passed, then I think we need to use that as an opportunity to do that. Uh, the tax revenue, I believe, can be used uh, to, to help with other types of drug abuse problems because we have a huge drug problem here. We, of course, have a, a large meth problem. We have a heroin problem. And we have a lot of folks who could probably be helped. And the, the revenue uh, that may be generated by uh, legalization of marijuana uh, could be used for better education, for better treatment, for better rehabilitation. And we can make some of these folks, hopefully, uh, contributing members of society again. And I think that benefits all of us. So that's what I think we need to do is, is, as county commissioners, be proactive and use it as an opportunity. All right. 
Thank you. Uh, Kurt, what would you say? I say no. Everybody's concerned about, uh, you can get marijuana anywhere. I mean, all you got to do is go down to junior high and you can buy it from any kid there. Uh, we're concerned about medical marijuana. And Rick said he was just concerned about the children and the children will be able to get the marijuana. Hell, if you legalize it, it's going to be in half the, the, the houses uh, in, uh, in Jackson County. It's really going to speed that up. I, uh, I don't have any problem with somebody wanting to get high, stay home, and eat a bag of cookies, whatever they want to do. But I do not want it. I think there's going to be unseen problems once it's legalized that you haven't even thought about now. And I can tell you right now, this county has enough problems. Thank you, Kurt. Tonya. Well, um, I'm, I'm sorry to not have too much to add because I don't. I really agree with everything that Rick Dyer said about the issue. Um, the new legislation will likely be passed and it will close the loophole, uh, hopefully, at least to a substantial extent, of the black market, which is usually the problems that are related to the violence and stuff that we get. So I agree with that. Kurt, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to talk about uh, recreational marijuana. Are you in favor of its legalization? Maybe just expound on your... I don't think either of them even answered the question, but as far as... Well, I'm not here to beat people up if they don't answer it. Uh, as far as legalized marijuana, what is it, uh, 70 or 72? Uh, was it 91? 91. 91, 91 yeah. 91. Uh, I do support it. Um, we already have legalized marijuana with the medical marijuana. You have guys that aren't medical technicians growing marijuana, and they grow about six times as much as they really need for their patients, which means hidden in the mar medical marijuana industry, there's a whole huge surplus, and all that huge surplus goes to the black market right now. At least with legalized marijuana, I would hope they would treat it like alcohol and they would regulate it, uh, they would tax it, and they would sell it like in a, uh, like they do uh, hard liquor, it'd be better controlled because right now, with medical marijuana, it's not being controlled at all. Now, I'm not for children getting it, but then children aren't supposed to get hard liquor either, but I think if we regulate it through the government, it'll be a whole lot better than having a bunch of backyard growers uh, that portray themselves as medical marijuana growers doing it. Um, as far as the taxes, you've seen a lot of cities here lately, first they were against marijuana, like the city of Medford, but then when they found out they could make a few bucks off it, all of a sudden they were for it. So are they really against marijuana or are they just for more taxes? The problem with taxing marijuana more, more than it already will be is that you create a black market. If it gets too expensive, then that's where black markets come from. So. If the government gets too greedy, right now I think they're going to tax at $35 an ounce. If they tax it more than that, then it's going to be so prohibitively expensive that nobody is going to buy it from the legal source. They'll be buying it from the illegal source. So anyway, the bottom line is, yes, I do support it. I think it's uh, good for us to regulate it versus the way it is right now, where it's kind of wild. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um by the way, I didn't get a chance to talk to the uh, candidates about this. Uh, did any of you have any questions for one another? I know that it says in here, you know, that we can, you know, you can ask a question of one another. I don't know if you're interested in doing that or not. Do we know? I think I'd rather take questions from the audience. Oh, okay. All right. Maybe we'll do that. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be okay more? with that. Uh, yeah, I would ask, uh, like to ask one more. One more. <laughs> of course, I love this one. What is your position on chemtrails? Is Lucretia here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with all due respect, I, I, I like that. I think we'll probably stick away from, stay away from that one for just tonight. All right, then we can talk about it on Monday, let's say. Uh, in all seriousness, though, um, let's see, Kurt, uh, you're going to be taking the, this one. Your, your top priority if you are elected commissioner, what is your agenda, your top priority agenda when you get in there? By the way, my position on Kim Trails is usually this. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> no, I, I uh, you know, that's, that's uh, well, I, I don't know if I can even narrow that down. I mean, I mean the list is, I've uh, been referred to as a single issue candidate. Uh, 
my God, I've, I've got a whole wall full of changes I want. Uh, one of the first things I want is to turn that uh, planning department and uh, a wrong side out. Uh, the first thing when you walk in, I want to see a complaint department right there where it says visitors and information. I want a complaint department. I would like to see a picture of everyone that works in there where a person that's had a bad problem with one of them can just find them, get their little faces up there, identify them, and make a formal complaint if they want. You can't make a complaint. It falls on dead ears. And I tell you, it's... Uh, it, it just needs to be shut down for a couple of weeks and uh, get with the union and the lawyers and see how many of them are going to be there uh, next month. And uh, those kind of changes will be huge. One of the other things is we have cars running all over. There's cars out there that none of us can afford, or most of us can't afford. Rick can. Uh, I can't uh, afford a car like they're driving. There's hundreds and hundreds of cars out there. and. We don't even know who those cars belong to and who's using them. Do you mean county cars? County cars. Okay. Uh, we've got county lands out there that are so misused and so neglected. I mean, I don't even know where you'd start. Uh, I have a very, very large list, but first place would be planning department and uh, code enforcement. Uh, these code enforcement guys aren't even, aren't even certified. They're giving you citations that can wind up with the loss of your home, and they're not even certified. So. It would be real hard for me to pick one thing. I, uh, um, one advantage for not having me is, uh, or voting for me is at my age, I probably won't live long enough to ever collect a retirement. Besides, I'm gonna be so busy uh, if I'm elected making changes that uh, uh, that alone will uh, open up a whole new economy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Tanya, priority agenda. Well, I, I intend to be extremely busy too, um, but I believe unemployment is still too high in this county. I believe that we are, and we know, we are lagging behind in the recovery as a, a compared to every other urban county in the state, and that is my first priority um, as county commissioner. Um, a second priority is um, county accountability as well, um, and I believe, again, Having that experience that I do in the law um, provides me with the tools uh, to know how to, to um, advance public policy, which allows me to hit the ground running when I get into to the position and will give me time to get out in the community, which is, I think, where commissioners need to be. We need to be out there listening to your concerns and making sure that our rules and operations are um, in the service of the citizens. Thank you. Kurt Ankerberg, your priority agenda, your punch list. That's what my boss calls it, the punch list, what's your punch list? Well, the primary job of the commissioner, as I said earlier, was to do the budget. And uh, I'll run the most efficient budget you can imagine in the county. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon the commissioners to do what they can to help the economy because there's a lot of poverty in Jackson County. And I'll do that by, as I said earlier, by reducing regulations, fees, permits, licenses, and uh, I won't raise your taxes. I think the biggest threat we face here in Jackson County is corruption. Um, if you look at the city of Medford, the city of Medford, a lot of the city councilmen were bought by the good old boys of the chamber, and in turn, they give the good old boys, they did a lot of zoning changes for them, they gave 30 million of your money, and the county just lied to you at the beginning of the year, when they told you they didn't have the money for this library, they lied to you. This library cost about five and a half million dollars to operate a year, and they told you didn't have the money to fund that. Yet, in June, Danny Jordan and Doug Bryenthal were both in the media bragging about how they added $17 million to the county surplus. Well, how can you add $17 million to the surplus when you don't have five million dollars to fund the libraries. Well, they lied because they want the libraries off their budget. They want to free up that money for something else, and I'll get to that in a minute. They also lied to you when they said they didn't have $200,000 for the extension center. They lied because they have a lot of the good old boys on the county budget. For instance, there's a gentleman who's the president of the Chamber of Commerce. His name is Bill Mance. Bill Mance also happens to be Rick Dyer's campaign manager Bill Mance 
in the last two years has got $170,000 from the county and sweetheart contracts to do make work jobs. So the county told you at the beginning of the year, they didn't have $200,000 to run the extension center, yet they got $170,000. They paid Bill Manson the last two years to do make work projects. Um, and there's more of that too. So why did the county lie to you? Because they wanted, they knew that you would vote for extra taxes for the extension center and the libraries, which you did do. The county got that money off their budget. They don't have to pay for the library anymore, but they still get the revenue. They still collect the $6 million a year in revenue that would have gone to the libraries. What do they want to do with it? The county wants to build, as we talked about earlier, they want to build a, a public-private convention center so the good old boys, meaning Brad Hicks of the chamber, he colluded with the commissioners to lie to the public, tell the public you don't have the money for the libraries so that they'll raise their taxes, we can take the libraries off the budget, now all of a sudden the county is flushing money. They got all kinds of extra money, and now they're gonna say, oh gosh, we have the extra money to pay for this convention center. So basically we have dishonest people running this county that lie to you to raise your taxes so they can use that money to pay for their cronies private development. So we have a real problem here with having honest politicians in this county. All right, thank you. Uh, Rick, your uh, take on well, your priority list. First of all, if we're gonna be 100% honest about everything, let's first uh, clear up a few things. Bill Mance is not the president of the chamber. Uh, Bill Mance owns a marketing company and he's not my campaign manager, he does marketing for my campaign. He was the, he was the chamber president then last year. His, his term just expired then. Anyway, uh, on, on to my priorities. Uh, of course, like I said before, I am focused on getting this county back to work, economic development. I've, I've laid out some of the plans that I have for that. I also want to make sure, again, that we create the, the climate and the atmosphere for business to succeed, businesses that are here now. Uh, and, and also, uh, the fiscal response, the po policies of fiscal responsibility that allowed us to be in the financial position we're in I want to continue those so we are able to provide the services and retain the quality of life that we've all come to enjoy and appreciate. Um, I know it's easy to point fingers, it's easy to, to come up with, with theories on what's going on. I think uh, what, what really uh, is going on is not the way it's portrayed. Um, I think, again, the county has not been run too poorly. We're in good financial position, uh, and I want to intend to keep us there so we can retain our quality of life and, and provide the services that are most important to the folks in Jackson County. All right, thank you, Rick. All right, now comes the time at which we'll kind of turn it over to the floor for a bit. And I would prefer, if you'd like to ask uh, candidates a question, prefer it to be something that all four can answer rather than so we can stay away from the, you know, when did you stop kicking your dog you know, kind, of, uh, kind of questions. Anybody on the floor wish to ask another question that we didn't get to tonight? Just go ahead and put your hand up, it's okay. Go ahead, MJ. Yeah, we attended the candidate forum the other night with the climate change people, and, uh -huh. and I heard your comments. And all three of the candidates there talked about um, the benefit of a carbon tax, like at all levels of the government. So specifically, I'd like to ask Tanya and the others, or it is Tanya, right? yep. and the others, you know, how they feel about that. But it sounded like you were talking about using the carbon tax to pay for some of that sustainability upgrades and all that kind of stuff, so I'd like to hear you. Thanks, MJ. Tanya? Sure. Um, Senator Bates was making um, it clear that if we're, if we're going to mitigate the impacts of, of climate change, that that's the kind of thing we need. There's, they, talk, they talk about it in terms of a tax. There's, uh, there's other potential models, and they're actually having, I think it's uh, several um, researchers are, are doing some research for the legislature now. One of them is like a cap and trade. But, and what I mentioned was that I believe that that is probably necessary in order to um, jumpstart or, or provide some, some assistance to the renewable energy um, technologies so that we can get more of that work done. I also said that I think we need strong leadership at the county level to assist in getting that done. That means 
getting out and ch chatting with people and explaining why it's all a great idea to transition to, to clean energy, which is what I was talking about the other night. And I believe that's a great economic development um, mechanism. Um, the other part of the question, um, I believe, was getting a little bit uh, a little tired tonight. Uh, was there uh, there was something else that you asked? Well, it was about you know, oh the the subsidies kind of the, the right. If you know you had, you had talked here and the other night about yeah upgrading facilities to bring them into the sustainable realm, and I guess my right. point was, are you? Is carbon tax what you're going to pay for, or how? Would you well, right pay? now, again, we're Clean Energy Trust is is uh, taking funds, you know, that would otherwise be the profits of the, the utility companies for purposes of, of doing this kind of work. Because the utility companies know they need to meet por portfolio standards, so this, there's there's that money available. Um, but yes, and that's part of the the, the difficulty with um, this cap and trade and, and carbon tax uh, legislation is we're going to need to decide where those funds go. And so there's big debates about it. There's some models out there. And so there's a couple of things that they're considering, and that's a um, revenue neutral tax, where it all is actually returned to the citizens. And it's not made part of the general fund of the state. And that has a lot of appeal. And I think British Columbia has that model. Another, another model is taking, uh, South Africa is now adopting a um, hybrid model, where they're using some of those funds to actually fund projects, because what they found is if, if folks are paying the tax, they want to see us actually transitioning. In order to do that, oftentimes we need to have those monies available to set up the solar array at, at the um, new enter enterprise. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Any of the other candidates want to weigh in on that? Uh, Kurt? I grew up in uh, Los Angeles in the 50s and 60s, and the smog there back then was so terrible that we could barely breathe. If you look at now, industry has cleaned up their act. We don't have a lot of pollution in industry like we used to have 30, 40 years ago. Cars are much more uh, energy efficient. They're much more pollution than they were years ago. I think we're already at a point now where we do a lot of things to keep the environment clean, yet we're the ones that are supposed to pay more cap and trade, more taxes. All cap and trade is, is a wealth transfer. That's all it is, is we're gonna tax you more. It's another vehicle to tax you more and put American business at a disadvantage. How much more of a disadvantage do you wanna put America at? If you look at the biggest polluters in the world, they're India and China. What are they gonna do about the cap and trade? They're, they're really bad. They're, we're not even the same league as them, yet, we're the ones that are expected to suck it up. I mean, we already are at a disadvantage because we have labor laws they don't have, we have pollution laws they don't have, and now you want to add more, which is going to cripple us more. Um, I don't think there's a need for cap and trade. I think that global warming is a, is a fraud on us, so I don't support cap and trade one iota. Rick, did you want to weigh in on that? There, there's not a lot of can add to that, but okay. I am absolutely opposed to cap and trade. I think that it is uh, just a drain on the economy unnecessarily, and uh, it's it, it is it's a wealth transfer, and I don't I don't support it whatsoever. Okay, Kurt, you want to weigh in? Cap and trade is a, a liberal idea. It, liberals are always looking for an answer to a problem that doesn't exist, and uh, it's just more the same thing. You know, I've been watching these elections for forty years; they're always the same. They sound the same. The hairstyle's different, the suit's a different color, but the bull crap's the same. Every time. Nothing changes. They're gonna tax, they're gonna make uh, the chickens bigger in your pot, they're gonna do all this wonderful stuff, and then they tax you, and fine you, and raise all the rates, and just screw you any way they can, and you guys just go out there and elect them again. Well. You've got a real max bag of nuts running for this office. You're going to have plenty of, uh, of us to look at and choose. And uh, I think you ought to take a real good look at uh, a carbon tax and tax and, uh, of any sort on energy. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Bill, if I may follow up, uh, you know, the true mark of leadership is leading from the front and being willing to ask people to follow you. 
So my question for any of the candidates that may support carbon taxes, do you buy carbon offsets now in the private sector of your own volition out of some sort of sense of goodwill and doing good? Or is it just something you're willing to voice upon everyone else to feel better about it? And if I may offer you an example, my wife and I, we give beyond what we can write off for our taxes, not because someone mandates it, but because we feel a desire to do it out of a sense of having been blessed with, with much, you know, those who are blessed with much, much is required. So my question is, are you willing to go pay for it out of your own pocket before you ask it to be foisted upon other people? <laughs> okay, no? I don't support cap and trade taxes, period. No. Go ahead. I, uh, I had uh, $196,000 saved up when I joined the Patriot Movement. I spent that $196,000 creating two government watchdog groups, writing for the U.S. Observer, going out and taking on the government on issues where they were doing a citizen wrong. I didn't get paid. I paid to do it. I put my money where my mouth is to the point that I'm living on my wife's retirement. So uh, I stepped up. Thank you. Thank you. Question two. If you're talking like about blue sky programs, that kind of thing, yeah. Sure. No, okay, so the thing is, that's I have to pay for that too, and I don't want to. Um, I'm a product of Humboldt State University. I know what green is. It was on my sweatshirt, and it was crammed down my throat. Um, so with, with the green agenda, you can go out on the private market and buy carbon credits, carbon offsets. There are companies that afford that. Do you do that? Do you put your carbon tax money where your mouth is? There, I don't think there is a mechanism to do it at our local level right now. Okay, and I think that's something that, that we could bring in. But I, I'd also just respond this way. Oil and gas companies have gotten lots of subsidies over the years. They make lots of profits. I don't have stock in oil and gas companies. Um, I believe that they can absorb the tax and don't have, to, have to, to pass it on to the consumers, and it just gives them an incentive to, to start developing renewables. That's all it does. That's the purpose of it. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Well, everything that you, every question that you've asked tonight um, centers around, absolutely centers around one thing, and that's Agenda 21, sustainable development. And so, and I think that, that for elected officials, it's one of the biggest pitfalls is not understanding the blueprint. Everything you're talking about tonight, all it goes back exactly to Agenda 21 and the blueprint. So what is your understanding of Agenda 21? Do you support it? Do you believe in it? Do you, uh, or do you oppose it? Looks like this one's for me. I don't okay. know much about that agenda. I really don't. No. What, I, what I'm espousing are, are things that I've learned through my, my review of policy and my interest in, in other subjects. I have no idea what that agenda is, so I don't sign on to any agenda. I look at what the policy is out there, and, that's, and, and that, that's what forms the basis of my views, that we need to transition to clean energy, and that's all I'm talking about. Thank you. Yes, yes please, uh, okay. go ahead. Um, I have a, is this I, for the whole board, or are you just going to? Well, yeah, everybody can answer. Okay, all right. I have a pet peeve of watching county government. We have a county administrator who is paid twice as much as the commissioners, and he wields an enormous amount of power. And I think it's an abomination that in a representative type of government, we have such a thing. A man is not accountable to a people who has such power. I would like to ask each of the candidates what they think about Danny Jordan and the influence and the power he has in this county. Let's go left to right on this particular one. Kurt, take it away. First of all, I think Danny Jordan has too much power because if you look at the past commissioners like Jack Walker, C.W. Smith, uh, Dave Gilmore, and so forth, none of them were a financial person. Not one of them were a financial person, and I am. So they placed an in inordinate amount of reliance upon Danny because he had skills they don't have. They needed him. 
Now I have the skills Danny Jordan has, and I can supervise him much more than any other commissioner ever has because I'm financially more advanced than him. Um, that's one of the reasons that Danny Jordan is making, like you said, $200,000. They need him more than he needs them. Now, I've never spoke to Danny Jordan in my life, never met him in my life either. I have met his uh, number one assistant, Harvey Bragg, and I've had a lot of uh, conversations with him. I don't want to talk about Danny Jordan's job now because I've met the guy, but I understand he has a three-year automatic renewal contract right now. I guarantee you the day I get into office, I'm gonna end the automatic renewal, because right now, he has three years on his contract. So if you were to terminate him today, you have to pay for three years of a contract period to you know fulfill the contract so I would want him to fulfill the contract unless they had a dereliction of duty but as far as the automatic renewal I'm going to end it right now um, also Danny Jordan I think he got this power when Jack Walker was really sick he was allowed to sign contracts I believe up to five million bucks that's way too much uh, I'm a financial person way more than Danny Jordan could ever hope to be and I'm not gonna allow him to have the power to sign a contract for five million. I'll reduce it to about maybe a half million dollars, and if he wants anything more than that, he'll have to come to me and get permission to sign the contract. Rick, what would you have to say about uh, I, county administration? I agree, Danny Jordan only has as much power as the commissioners care to give him. Um, and I, if I'm elected, the power that's given to me by the people I'm going to use, and I will not let anybody usurp or undermine my authority uh, but I will use Danny as a, as a valuable resource because I've know, known him to be that. Danny is a smart guy and Danny does have innovative ideas, but he wouldn't be making decisions on my behalf. Uh, and, and that's something that, again, only happens if the commissioners allow it. So if, if you're not strong enough to stand up and make your own decisions, then you probably shouldn't be in the position in the first place. Kurt, take a whack. Well, I, my dealings with Danny Jordan goes back quite a while. Uh, Gene Wallman back there uh, 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 did an article on Danny when he was being hired to take over. Uh, uh, we were able to expose uh, some of the corruption going on in Jackson County. It wound up in the di dismissal of Bob Grindstaff, who uh, was the head of community justice. And uh, I won't go into all of that. It would take a whole other meeting. But she looked into Danny Jordan. And she did, a, did an interview with him before he came to work as uh, the head of community justice. And uh, her and I both agreed after listening to her tapes when she interviewed him that uh, he was beyond smart. Uh, he was very cunning. And there's a big difference between cunning and smart. Uh, I think that uh, a strong commissioner could take advantage of uh, Danny's talents, and he is smart and uh, use them. I don't like, uh, I'm with Kurt, I don't like him being able to write a check for five million of the taxpayers' dollars. I don't like the fact that uh, those spineless commissioners down there gave him $685,000 of your money to buy another house. Not a dwelling to live in, but a second house. And uh, so that'd be a lot of change. Uh, one, uh, if we put some new commissioners in there, Danny's going to have some new bosses, and he's going to have some new problems. Uh, another thing that Danny's uh, able to do is he influences the commissioners to the point of almost browbeating them in a lot of the meetings. And they just don't. Rasher, you know, he's never had any cojones. He's a nice guy. Uh, Scundrick, he won't stand up for anything except something he can sign on the back and deposit. And, well, I don't even want to go into the other one. I just, never mind, sorry about that. That's okay, that's all right. It's an uh, open forum. Uh, Tanya, you want to take a, take a stab at this issue? No, I'm going to pretty much decline to answer the question. I, I'm going to keep an open mind with regard to staff, and, but I can tell you that you know, the role of the commission is to, uh, to super, supervise staff, and I've up to power so to the extent that that's an issue there won't be any any, any concerns there and the reason I'm declining too is because I got to be the only one to answer the last question and I do want to just make one clarification I don't know about this agenda 21 to the extent that there's like a list of agenda I did look it up in in the context of being asked a question about it on a survey and and saw that it's um, just generally about sustainability so 
to the extent that there's a bigger agenda there and it means this, this, and this, and this and about sustainability, I, I don't necessarily sign on to that. But I will tell you, I do believe in sustainability. And this is the way I define it, though. I don't think we should be using resources that our grandchildren will need. And that's a simple definition, and that is the long view that, that I will employ as a county commissioner. Thanks. Okay. Uh, all right. I, I, don't, I never did get to address that lady's yeah, question on Agenda 21. Yeah, we have the other three candidates addressing Agenda 21. Yeah, because it wasn't... You know, you're, you're right. It, it, I think that I I think that it was something where I just figured you were directing it. Thank no, you, Jan. No. Public-private partnerships, uh, the, the carbon... All, every, every, uh, averting the consequences is in the blueprint. So it's important for them, any elected official, to understand the blueprint. I'll answer it if they want to. Yeah, if you want to, go ahead. Yeah, it's a little more I, free form at this point. So. I, I strongly oppose Agenda 21. Basically what Agenda 21 is, is a attempted takeover of the government by the UN. So you have a one world government run by the UN. So I oppose that. Um, in conjunction with that, if you listen to the Bill Meyer show, he talks about gangrene all the time and about uh, the Mojen 21 and so forth uh, with Kitzhopper. Um, and he talks about how the Medford City government gets a lot of grants from the state, from the feds, and there's a lot of strings attached, and therefore you got to do a lot of the bidding of the federal government and the state government with those grants. Well, I oppose that, and so I'm not going to take grants from the federal government or from the state government where there's the strings attached where I'm required to do something I wouldn't normally do. Um, so I'm not into Agenda 21. I'm their worst enemy. And uh, the same with the gang green group. I'm not their friend. I'm their enemy. Okay, uh, Rick or Kurt, do you want to weigh in? On yes. Okay. I, I, I agree with everything that, uh, that Kurt just said. But uh, an interesting thing on that, I had uh, cousins and uncles that were in the military and in military intelligence in World War II. And a lot of people don't realize we had 1,500 British agents doing character assassinations on politicians here in the United States that did not want us to get in to World War II. And the one world government theory was back there then. And it was well played out and documented. And uh, World War II and almost every war we've had was about one world government and about shifting power, shifting monies. and. Uh, the biggest enemy you have, uh, uh, Bill had a, a wonderful guest on the other night. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. He's written a book on uh, administrative rule. And uh, I've written several articles on administrative rule. And uh, Gene Wallman back there and I have worked together on that for about uh, 10 years. And administrative rule is one of the tools that they, that they use uh, in these agencies. And, uh, in answer to the question I think you were looking for, uh, you get two like-minded commissioners in, uh, down here, and uh, you can see change. The only way that they'd be able to stop us once the people are behind us in this county is either try to get something on you and put you in jail or put a smoking hole in you because it's very real. And uh, anytime somebody says that they don't believe it, they don't buy it, well, they just lost all credibility with me. Thank you. By the way, I was just looking up who I was, who he was talking about, Professor Philip Hamburger. Yeah. yeah. How do I forget that? <laughs> you know, how do you forget a guy named Hamburger, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bill, can I just make one last clarification? Yeah, sure, please, go ahead. I, I wasn't saying I don't believe it, I don't buy it. I just said I, I'm not aware of a blueprint. I don't know anything about it. I understand. It. Okay. No, I, I understood that. I, yeah, I wasn't asking the question, though. Uh, Rick, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on this, too. There's not a lot like that. I do not agree with anything that I, that I do know about Agenda 21. I think it's a scary proposition. I'm a big believer in personal property rights and our current way of life. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's any reason to, to, to have a agenda to change that. So I would oppose it at, at every, uh, every facet of it. Okay. Like I said before, I believe that there is a purpose for those, and, and I went through that earlier, but I do believe that there is some benefit to be had by that, and 
I don't, I don't think that makes me a proponent of Agenda 21. I think that makes me a proponent of trying to do what's best for this county and economic development and the folks in it. Okay, uh, I'm probably just going to take one more question because we're just running uh, short on time and I wanted to make sure every candidate gets a good chance to do a, a good closing statement. So, man, go I've right heard, ahead. I've heard some comments um, that said if I were elected commissioner, I would do this, I would do that, I would, ma I would make this. Don't three commissioners, or at least two, have to agree before something can get changed? It can't just be one or another doing it? Well, it depends on how heavily armed you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, totally being facetious on that. <laughs> I'm taking over, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it would take a quorum, would it not? Gentlemen, it, it, it takes two uh, commissioners to make it happen. Yes, I mean, I think what we're talking about is just what our focus would be. Um, obviously, to get anything done, you're going to need to to be able to persuade uh, one or two other people. So, and I only have one gun compared to all of the ones who are chancellors. Okay, all right, uh, Kevin, I'd like to enlist your help if we could, please. Sure. Come on up here, and I just have the four numbers up here, and we're just going to choose the order in which we go with closing. Uh, well, hang on, hang on. Let me do it again. Like, I had it exposed. Go ahead. Just reach in. Reach in and grab one. Okay, we're going to go so starting with Kurt uh, Chancellor, number one. So, Kurt I'm sorry, Kurt Ankerberg, pardon me. I get a closing statement. Yeah, would you like a closing statement? How long do I get? A couple minutes? Now, until I, till I turn your mic off. <laughs> now, I, I would say, uh, two, in fact, honestly, they say up to five minutes. I think that at this point, maybe three minutes, two, three minutes probably would probably be good. What do you say? Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming out. I think political apathy in the Rogue Valley is rampant. Very few people vote. And so the fact that you're out here, the fact that you're interested, I think it's uh, notable. And, and I really appreciate you coming out to listen to us tonight. Um, why am I the best candidate? Well, as I told you earlier, I've been a CPA 30 years. I've worked at big firms. I've dealt with big clients, complex issues that nobody else on this board has even seen. They see, they talk about being small business owners. Well, the county is not a small business. The county is a huge business. It's a $300 million business with 900 employees. Now, I'm the only person that has experienced that, that's managed large entities like that and dealt with large budgets like that. Um, I have a long history, for those of you who live in Medford, I have a long history as a community activist. Um, a couple years ago, the city council tried to jam a, a water park down our throat. I was the lead opponent against it because it wasn't right for us. They want to jam it down our throat. They want to jam uh, an aquatic center down our throat. I was a lead opponent against that as well. I was also the lead opponent against the Lithia Commons. Um, I very strongly oppose public-private partnerships because they're corrupt and the winner in the game is the guy that's best buddies with the politicians to make the decisions. In this case, it's the Chamber of Commerce. Um, like I said, I have a long history of fighting for the general public, for the middle class. I don't represent the good old boys like some other people on this dais. I represent you, the middle class, and I'll fight like hell for you if you vote for me. Um, we'll make some changes. When Skundrick and Rasher were elected four years ago, they gave you the same old, the same old words of we're going to improve the economy and so forth and so on. And so did Doug Breinthal. They haven't done a damn thing in the four years they've been in office. I guarantee you, if you elect me, I'm going to move fast and quickly. Um, I get things done fast. Um, when I worked at Moss Adams as a manager there, one of the things I was known for is uh, excellent project management because I got the jobs done quickly and under budget and in time. And so that's what you can expect from me as a commissioner. Um, I'll run an efficient ship that will represent you and I won't represent the good old boys. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kurt. Rick, Rick Dyer. I certainly don't represent the good old boys. I don't even know who the good old boys are, to be honest with you. But I do represent my passion and my concern for the county. I have lived here almost 40 years. I tend to be here the rest of my life. I do own a business here. I've been in business here for a long time. I have a 10-year-old son that, that attends public school here. I am deeply invested in this county. 
I have volunteered my services on the Rogue Valley Transportation District Board for five years. I volunteer my time in youth coaching, in classroom volunteering, in Easter Seals Advisory Council, and many other charitable and civic organizations. I do care about the quality of life, and I care about the prosperity of this generation and future generations. And there is some, some selfishness to it because I do have a 10-year-old son, and I would love to see him have the opportunity to stay here, raise his family here, make a good living, enjoy the same quality of life that we have. And I do think I have a unique skill set. I have, again, 25 years in business. I think that's important. I think that teaches you a lot of lessons that come in very handy in the job of county commissioner. Uh, I, I run large businesses with lots of employees, large budgets. Um, I have a degree in business administration and accounting. I have a law degree. I earned my law degree in 2007 while running my business, while serving on the RVTD board, while coaching, while volunteering in the classroom, I was putting in 25 to 30 hours a week studying, reading law books, writing essays, uh, taking tests, and four years later I graduated the top third of my class and then I passed the most difficult bar exam in the country. Uh, and, and Kurt Ankerberg said I would never be able to practice law here. Well, there's a person who did exactly, went to the exact same school that I did and is practicing law here in Medford, so that is not the case. It is true. Okay. Well, it is true that there's, anyway, uh, I do possess a, a, the passion, I possess the, the education, the background, the principles and values, I think, that will help me make the decisions that will lead us into a more prosperous future and preserve our quality of life, and that's what I intend to do. Thank you. Curtis. Thank you. <laughs> I like to help out wherever I can. Uh, Maybe I can help Rick. He doesn't know who the good old boys are. <laughs> Will that be the boys that gave you a $20,000 check? Uh, the, uh, how much? 35. Well, you're the bookkeeper. I'll take your word. <laughs> and uh, I looked at your endorsement in the voters pamphlet, and there's a list of the biggest who's who of the good old boys in the county. So that'll help you out. Um, my, uh, my, I don't have any. Um, I have a very small amount of uh, people giving. I've, I have a tough time asking people for money. I always have. Um, hell, I have a tough time asking people for money that owe me money. <laughs> but I, I don't know why. I just hate to ask people for money. But uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, what I was talking about was two like-minded commissioners. And uh, there's some like-minded commissioners on running for that other, uh, other uh, position. And two like-minded commissioners on at the same time can make changes that you, you, you can't even imagine in government. And uh, I would like to think that this is one of the most important in elections uh, in decades. And uh, I, uh, I ask that you do the right thing. Look at each one of us. Uh, I'm mean, real easy to, well, I don't want to say I'm easy to look at. I am kind of cute, my wife said, but uh, I'm easy to look at from the standpoint that all you have to do is type in Kurt Chancellor, and you can type in Kurt Chancellor just at Google. You can type in Kurt Chancellor's articles. You can type in any of that, and you're going to see a lot about what I'm about, and you don't have to believe anything I tell you. It's in print. My articles have been picked up all over the internet by all sorts of websites. And so you've heard what I've had to say today about the articles out there. I'd ask that you look at them. And uh, I joke around, but I, I take my leadership positions. I take my skills as an investigative reporter, and I take my skills as a leader of very, very serious. I have people that have followed me. I see a lot of them in this room. We created government watchdog groups. We protested. And it's really funny, you know, I'm used to liberals protesting, but it's kind of funny to see a conservative out there protesting. And especially when we see 150 or 200 protesting. And I found out I missed the boat because protesting is a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt.
Tanya, well, I don't some closing you, thoughts? But I'm, all, I'm, I'm fading here, so I'm not going to... You, you guys have heard a bit about what I intend to do and what my background is, and I'll just close with this. I believe that, that business, um, wants, or business wants to come and people want to invest in um, our community where there is good, strong government. We, we want um, to be able to have law enforcement that's operational, roads that are maintain, maintained, and good, clear land use laws. So, you know, they know what they can do with their property, and they also know what their neighbors can't do with their property. So, business needs that. That's the kind of good government we need to strive for. And then, like I said, um, besides trying to in, in, uh, foster that investment, I also am really, really passionate about accountability and getting out there and organizing and developing the community. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Folks, I just wanted to uh, thank you for coming out, but I would also hope that you would uh, give a, a round of applause for all these candidates because <laughs> Tanya, Rick, and Curry. Because it is a grueling schedule for all of the candidates, and it is not a glamorous job that you're campaigning for. At least the campaigning part about it is certainly not uh, not glamorous. And. <laughs> And auto is a lot of fun or easy either. But we appreciate them coming out, being honest with you. I appreciate your questions too. And I would also add that on election night, uh, we're going to be partnering with uh, NBC5, Channel 5, over at KMD and uh, going live uh, starting at uh, 6, 7 o'clock at night. I know we won't have any election returns until later that evening. But of course, uh, we're going to be trying to talk to a lot of these people, the winners and the losers. And of course, I don't know, the, maybe the losers are... I don't know. Should we talk with losers? I know maybe sometimes they're a little drunk and disorderly. <laughs> and you try to, I don't know. But uh, I thank you for coming out. Thanks so much uh, for your attention and your questions. And be well and be an informed voter. Spread the word, okay? A big round of applause for Mr. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colby. And now it's a great time if you want to go up and uh, talk to any of the... Uh, the candidates before they pass out, now will be a good time. All right? <laughs>